Watch. Every organ of the body has sits in a cavity and it has a thick tough lining that covers the inside of that body cavity and then a thin delicate saran wrap that covers the organ itself. Say yes. The lungs are no different. And the lining of the lungs is called the pleura. And there are two linings. The thick, tough lining that lines the inside of the thoracic cavity is called the parietal pleura. Then you have a space. Anyone know what that is called? The pleural space. And then you have a thin, delicate layer that covers the lungs directly. Write this down. In the pleural space, there's actually negative pressure. There's like a vacuum. And that prevents us from blowing out all of the air in our lungs. You cannot blow out all the air in your lungs, right? So if you try to blow out all the air in your lungs, the amount of air that's left in your lungs after you blow out all the air you can is called the residual volume. Say yes. Okay. Now, very important, very important that you know this. Write this down. Never forget it. You need to include this somewhere. Maybe on your Facebook. The parietal pleura of both lungs are separate. The visceral and parietal pleura of both lungs are separate. What that means is, is that if something happens in your right lung because they are sectioned off by the parietal pleura, that it won't necessarily affect the left lung. Do you follow that? And that's important. And again, another example of the body doing stuff that makes sense. And in the pleural space, this area here, there's negative pressure that prevents you from completely collapsing your lungs. Write this down. The parietal pleura of both lungs are directly connected to the diaphragm. What's connected to the diaphragm? Of both lungs. Say yes. How many people had chemistry? Good. How many people remember Boyle's Law? How many people remember that? What's Boyle's Law? Pressure and volume. That's very good. Okay. Shamika, you must be... Did you drink some A&P juice before you got to class? Okay. That's what I do. I'm taking Kirkland sparkling water, taking this off, and putting in crayon A&P juice and selling it out of the back of my Jeep. Four bucks a bottle. If you drink two bottles of A&P juice before you take a quiz, guaranteeing you 83%. Even if you don't get it, I'll give it to you. So you buy more A.M.P. juice. <laughs> and all it is is Gatorade. <laughs> all I'm going to do is make it. I won't even get you Gatorade. I'll get you Kool-Aid and put a little salt in it. That's what Gatorade is, by the way. Here we go. Watch. Boyle's Law states that volume and pressure are inversely related. I'll simplify that even more. Boyle's Law states that if you increase the volume volume of your lungs that leads to a decreased pressure inside the lungs and where do things always go high to low high concentration to low or in this case high pressure to low so watch the diaphragm completely separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. This is important. And in its relaxed state, the diaphragm is dome-shaped. It's like this. You got me? Watch. Like this. Boom. You with me? When the diaphragm contracts, it flattens out. So the diaphragm normally like this, 
when it contracts, it pulls down. So what's connected to the diaphragm? The parietal pleura. So when you contract the diaphragm, it's going to pull down the parietal pleura. And what's going to happen to the length of the lungs? And when you increase the volume of your lungs, what will happen to the pressure inside your lungs? It will go down. Now atmospheric pressure becomes greater than the pressure in your lungs, and air moves into your lungs. Say you got that. All right, so watch. You guys didn't watch Terminator? That's like the greatest movie ever made. Yeah, back the 70s. What? My feelings are hurt now. I'm going to cry. Okay, who cares about that? Tell me you got that, guys. That's how we breathe. What nerve controls breathing? That's what nerve controls breathing. I'm waiting. For real? Oh, Lord. No one's paying attention, huh? Is your diaphragm skeletal, cardiac, or smooth muscle? Somebody develops a spinal cord injury, can they move the muscles 
contract the muscles below the spinal cord injury. No. So watch. The medulla oblongata controls breathing. The nerve that stimulates the diaphragm to contract is called the phrenic nerve. The what? Phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve. P-H-R-E-N-I-C. Phrenic nerve. Say yes. The phrenic nerve that innervates the diaphragm to make the diaphragm contract exits the spinal cord between cervical vertebrae number three and cervical vertebrae number five. Are you with me? So if you damage your spinal cord above C5, the medulla cannot communicate with the phrenic nerve to cause the diaphragm to contract. So the old saying is, C5, still alive. Huh. You got me? If you damage your spinal cord below C5, but typically like above T4, like you're a quadriplegic, but the medulla can communicate with the phrenic nerve. So if you know, if you are taking care of a quadriplegic and they do not require mechanical ventilation, you know that their injury occurred below C5 and typically above T4. If they are a quadriplegic and they require mechanical ventilation, you know their injury occurred above C5 because the medulla can no longer communicate with the phrenic nerve. Say yes. Tell me you got that. Can a quadriplegic or paraplegic pee on their own? Can they? A paraplegic can? A paraplegic can either. They have to cat themselves every two hours. Quadriplegic, they can't cat themselves, so they need a Foley. I asked my uh, general classes. I'm not being rude. I'm just going to try to explain to you the difference between a a female nurse and a male nurse, right? Watch. Does a paraplegic or a quadriplegic guy get an erection? No. No. <laughs> yes or no? No. No. no? They do. An erection is reflexive most days. <laughs> It's reflexive. I'll give you an example. My kid, right? He was like in eighth grade. He comes out of the bathroom, right? He's got this pissed off look on his face. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? He goes, you know, Dad, I'm just walking around like in school or whatever. And all of a sudden, my dick gets hard. <laughs> and I said, talk to me when it doesn't. Then you have a problem, right? So you know what happens when you're a kid, you got no dick control, right? And that's what happens because it's reflexive. Do you understand? So watch. I was taking care of a quadriplegic in Chicago when I was going to graduate school. So every month I would have to change his catheter. So he would say to me, Tim, can you pull out the old one and then come back in an hour and put in the new one? And I'm like, absolutely. So that's what I would do. And then I would come back, and when I came back, he was sleeping and had a smile on his face. <laughs> now watch. He was 32 years old. He's a 32-year-old man with a body that don't work. Do you understand? But it's reflexive. Ejaculation is reflexive. So he must have paid an aid that I said, I don't want to know to help a brother out, and he felt better. Do you understand? Now, the female nurses wouldn't do that for him. I said absolutely, because I, I was a guy, right? And I'm like, that sucks. So that's the difference. Because <laughs> well, the risk of infection, I'm like, dude, are you willing to risk the, infect, uh, the infection, potential infection? He's like, yes. I'm like, I would too. So absolutely. So you did it? Absolutely. Well, no, I didn't. You know, I just put the <laughs> catheter back in. 
<laughs> I ain't going. I ain't that nice. <laughs> tell, tell me you followed that, guys. Yeah. So, would you guys have done that? I gave him an hour for the aide to help him out. And you can't do that when a catheter's in there. Yeah. So, yeah. And the other female nurses for years would not do that. Oh, no. I, oh, God. You're missing the point. See, you guys are going right to the gutter, right? I'm trying to tell you that. Like, but watch. He was still a 32-year-old guy mentally. Right. Do you understand? Right. But right, that's what he needed, and he got it somehow. And I didn't answer the questions. All I know, he was always asleep when I got back. <laughs> and he was always coming. And then he'd wake up. I'm hungry. <laughs> you got a smoke? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Can I tell you, though, like, when my girl comes over, like, in the middle of the night, you know, I wake up, I'm like, man, I'm hungry. <laughs> Wasn't hungry all day. And I don't, I look for cheesecake, you know? That stuff is so good. I didn't have cheesecake till I was 25. I had it in Las Vegas. My buddy's like, you want some cheesecake? I'm like, no. He goes, dude, you got to try it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I try, I'm like, damn, that stuff was good. I just looked at it. I'm like, it, looked, ugh, it looks like a big zit. <laughs> Anyways. What? Who cares? I explained how and why you breathe, right? Last time I explained why you breathe. And it's not due to the buildup of CO2 in arterial blood. It's indirect. It's directly what? No one looked at this stuff at all. I'm talking to myself. Yeah, forget it. Yeah. So you know what? That's another guy move. Watch. You're talking to your man, and you ask him a question. Like, what did you have for supper last night? And if he's about to lie to you, he'll go, huh? That little huh gives you an opportunity to repeat that question so and it also gives them a little time to think of a lot right so ask me a question anything go ahead hey, come on What's your for huh <laughs> See? And you can always tell if a guy is lying you want to know how his mouth is moving Now, when I was younger, I'll be honest, I lied to my ex-wife just to avoid a fight. Now, I am too old to remember my lies. I always know the truth now. But watch, the knife cuts both ways, ladies. So if you don't know how your husband's going to respond and he's honest, don't ask the question. Write that down. The education continues. Yeah, a lot of times there isn't. Tell me you got that, guys. Okay, watch. How do you increase the amount of air into your lungs? Very simple. You increase the volume of your lungs. Say yes. Okay, here we go. Did I explain to you the lining of your lungs, the, in, the lining that lines the respiratory tract? Did I explain that to you? Simple answer, yes or no. Okay, I'm going to explain that to you now, and I'm going to answer a question as I'm explaining it. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. I want this whole thing, by the way. All right. Have you seen this before? Write this down. The line of the rest... Respiratory tract is very vascular. Tons of blood vessels. 
and the entire lining, all the way from your nose down to your bronchioles, has cells that are ciliated. What's the function of cilia? It's to move stuff, right? So the cilia beat, right? And they always beat from the lower airway to the upper airway. So they clean the lungs lower to upper. Say yeah. In about every fifth or sixth ciliated cell, there is embedded in it a special cell called a goblet cell. And what do goblet cells produce? Right. Gobble, gobble. Ready? Okay. Now watch. And this is important. The education is going to continue big time. All right. Wait. Okay. Watch. Embedded in a goblet cell, the membrane of the goblet cell are ion channels. One of the ion channels is a chloride ion channel. You with me? The other one is a sodium ion channel. You ready? Now watch. There is a law called the law of electroneutrality. Did I explain this to you? I'm going to explain it to you now. What that states is that the number of positively charged particles in the blood has to be equal to the number of negatively charged particles in the blood. And that the number of positively charged particles in the cell has to be equal to the number of negatively charged particles in the cell. You got me? So that in body compartments, blood and cell, the overall charge has to be neutral. That the number of positively charged particles cancel out the number of negatively charged particles. You got me? All right. So that's important that you understand that. Now, oh crud. Now watch. When the goblet cell creates mucus, in this case, will give the guy a little bit of a respiratory infection. Okay? It's got a little green googies. This is mucus. The mucus that is produced by a goblet cell is very thick. But when that mucus is produced, chloride from a goblet cell leaves through a chloride ion channel, and that chloride enters the mucus. Who's with me? Guys? Now, chloride is negatively charged. So to, in order to maintain that law of electroneutrality, a sodium ion leaves through a sodium ion channel and enters the mucus as well. And what does sodium draw with it by osmosis? Water. And any time you add water to anything, you thin it out. So the mucus that's created in goblet cells by virtue of sodium leaving, or chloride leaving, then sodium following, then sodium uh, water following the sodium by osmosis, that's normal good mucus. But there's a, a person out there with a genetic anomaly where the gene that codes for chloride channels in goblet cells is defective. It's a, they have a genetic mutation where they either do not make chloride channels in goblet cells or the chloride channels that are made are they don't work so what happens is the goblet cells creates the mucus but if they don't have chloride channels will the chloride be able to leave and if the chloride doesn't leave what's not going to leave to maintain that law of electroneutrality the sodium and if the sodium don't leave you're not going to add water to it say yes those people have cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a result of a genetic anomaly where they have absent or impaired chloride channels in goblet cells. So not only is the respiratory system affected, but any part of the body that secretes mucus is affected. So what other parts of their body secrete mucus? <laughs> The GI tract, right? So these people have problems with digestion. And I'll explain more about that later. What about your reproductive tract? Yeah. 
right? The uterus and fallopian tubes secrete mucus, right? So when the woman ovulates and the cilia and the fimbrae go, come here, Herman, and then they bring the egg up into the fallopian tube, the mucus is so thick that it can't enter the fallopian tube correctly, and the mucus gets so thick that when Michael Phelps tries to inseminate that egg, it can't swim through the thick mucus, so they are infertile. They can't get pregnant. Tell me you got that. And the reason it's called cystic fibrosis, it was first isolated in the pancreas. They saw scarring and cyst in the pancreas. That's why it's called cystic fibrosis. Now, watch. I'm going to give you a little hint here because I like you guys as far as you know. Watch. In clinical, when they give you a scenario, and it's a physiologic scenario, like say someone with cystic fibrosis, you always, your intervention or what you need to do first, your priorities are, you always think what's going to kill the person first. So are you going to die right away if you got gas? No. But if you can't breathe, are you going to die right away? So when people with cystic fibrosis, your first priority is their respiratory system, their respiratory tract, because that's when it's going to kill them first. Tell me you got that. So, watch. Bacteria be loving on mucus. So the mucus gets so thick that the cilia gets overwhelmed. They can't move that mucus, and that mucus starts collecting in the lower airways. What happens is the bacteria start growing, and they start blocking off airways. That's why a person with cystic fibrosis is on, almost always on prophylactic antibiotics, meaning they're taking antibiotics all the time. That's why people with cystic fibrosis should not be hanging out together. And this is true. Because the bacteria that they've gotten used to, their normal flora, may be different from another person's normal flora. So if they hack a loogie on another person with cystic fibrosis, that can kill them. What's that? You saw that on Grey's Anatomy? Yeah. Oh, were they hacked a loogie on it? Oh, they wanted to get married? Oh. Oh, that's sad. Why would you want to get together with somebody who has cystic fibrosis, right, if you have cystic fibrosis? I wouldn't want to do that. I'd want to get together with somebody who's healthy. Hey, baby. All right, I can't breathe, but you're healthy. Hey. What do you do? Yeah. I don't know. Because she, she already lost a sibling to it, too. Yeah, they usually live to the ripe old age of about 35. Yeah, he died. Yeah, and it's usually due to uh, respiratory complications. But uh, it sucks. And then uh, you ever see that percussion vest that you got? No. You ever see it? I'll show it to you in a minute. But this is what I want to explain to you real quick. Watch. This is... This is why understanding, at least at a basic level, the problems with the disease, I guarantee you that most of you thought cystic fibrosis was purely a respiratory disease. Am I right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask a question. Like that fibroid thing or whatever, or women who can't have kids, and don't they like give them a hysterectomy or something? For the people with cystic fibrosis, yeah, yeah they t they they will. I'm not sure why they do that. Yeah, I'm not sure. But uh, watch. You, and again. Oh no, no, it's a big one. Is respiratory, but watch. You learned in general, generally, this is the pancreas. 
the pancreas releases digestive enzymes from pancreatic cells, dumps them into the pancreatic duct, and they get washed into the duodenum to digest your, you know, fruity pebbles. You got me? Now, these ducts have goblet cells that secrete mucus. And these ducts in people with cystic fibrosis secrete mucus that's very thick. So when their pancreas releases digestive enzymes, those digestive enzymes, because of the thick mucus, don't get washed into the duodenum completely. So those pancreatic enzymes remain in the pancreatic duct. And when they remain in the pancreatic duct, they will do their job. They digest carbs, fats, and protein. And you're not going to believe this, but the pancreas, the cells, are made out of carbs, fats, and protein. So those enzymes will begin to digest your pancreas. That's what pancreatitis is. So watch, body does stuff that makes sense. There are chemicals in the lining of the duodenum that detect pancreatic enzymes and then feed back on the pancreas to say, okay, no more, don't. So people with pancreas or cystic fibrosis, they will take pancreatic enzymes. And that prevents the pancreas from releasing pancreatic enzymes. So that's how they combat that. So Tell me. They they yes. Tell me you got that. They also have problems with uh, gallbladder issues because the cystic duct is full of that thick mucus. When the gallbladder contracts, that bile remains in the common bile duct and not into the duodenum, and it causes the gallbladder to become inflamed. So it sucks all the way around. And then taking the antibiotics all the time. Absolutely. Yep. That's why they don't live that The biggest reason they don't live that long is it's usually, uh, a lot of times they can go septic from the pancreatitis, and they don't have the antibiotics that they can use to treat it, or they die from respiratory failure. But you ever, you ever see a percussion vest? I hate this with little kids. God, I hate that. Why do I show our kids? Well, because that's the only good video, and it's quick. So here's a little kid with uh, cystic fibrosis, and she's got a percussion jacket. Aww. I just hate that. <laughs> she is. He's really excited. So watch. So the, the secretions get really thick. So what that percussion jacket does is it kind of shakes up the secretions and loosens them, and then they can cough them out easier. And it, <laughs> and it prevents the uh, secretions from consolidating. And when you get consolidated mucus and bacteria, you have pneumonia. That's pneumonia. It really depends. It depends on how bad it is. They usually do it a couple of times a day. And then what they'll do too is they will give them an albuterol treatment prior to that. And then that, they'll do the percussion and then they'll actually lay them down like and use gravity. And they'll take what, uh, you ever play air hockey? They, these little rubber things that you put in your hand and you'll percuss them this way to try to get that stuff out. But that's a percussion jacket. Right. I know it. I know. I hate that. I, uh, I told you I worked on a pediatric oncology unit for one day. I went there and I saw these little kids, right, watching like Teletubbies or little bald-headed kids, you know, and like ah, they're laughing. And the thought that I could not get out of my head was that in a month you'll be dead, and I could not deal with that. Watch, you are an old geezer. And you smoke, drink, and swear, and don't read the textbook, and you end up with heart disease, you get what you hit, right? Those little kids didn't do anything wrong, nothing. And I, I could, couldn't deal with that. So I'm like, yeah, I'm out, you know. And the nurses who, who can do that, 
to me, are the most incredible human beings I've ever met in my life. Ever. I cannot believe what they do. Because every day you walk in there, and it is fucking tragic. Pardon my French. Right? To see those little kids, and like, they didn't do anything wrong. That's what bothers me. You know? And just think, you know, you guys, all you would have to do is read the textbook, and I wouldn't bother you. She wants to fight. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Better share an agreement, huh? All right, that's okay. I ain't afraid. How many people explain uh, understand cystic fibrosis? Yeah. Can I show you how they test for it? Do you want to know? Yeah. For real? Yeah. Okay. Just so you know, no one will explain this to you. You think I'm lying? I can't wait. You know. When you see me on campus, you'll see me in a whole different light. You'll see this like little halo above my head. <laughs> Here we go. Let's in sweat. That's good. Water. Salt, sodium, and chloride. Tell me you got that. Okay, watch. Here we go. Here is a sweat duct, sweat gland, sweat duct. The sweat duct goes all the way to the surface of the skin. Tell me you got that. It's in the dermal layer, the true layer, right, where there's blood vessels. Look, blood vessels. See that? Mm -hmm. So Timmy's going to simplify it for you. Do you know why? No, because I'm cool like that. Here we go. So you have the blood, okay? Then you have the sweat duct. And you're not going to believe this, but embedded in the sweat duct are ion channels. Oh, 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 you got me? Watch, when you sweat, as the sweat moves through the sweat duct, the ions, some of them are reabsorbed back into the blood. You got me? Sodium and chloride, along with a little bit of water. So in people with cystic fibrosis, they have absent or malformed chloride channels, including in sweat ducts. So when they sweat, do they reabsorb chloride? If they don't reabsorb chloride, do they reabsorb sodium? So what happens to the amount of sodium and chloride on the skin? It goes up. So what they do, watch, it all relates. If you give somebody a drug that blocks the parasympathetic nervous system, what's the only nervous system that's working? And what does the sympathetic nervous system do to sweat glands? It stimulates it. So on the volar surface of your forearm and the kid, they will clean off a spot and they will inject a drug called pilocarpine which blocks the parasympathetic nervous system. So that area of the skin will begin to sweat. And then what they do is they take a Mr. Coffee filter and they soak up the sweat along with the salt. And then they measure the amount of sodium and chloride in the sweat. And if it's higher than normal, that's diagnostic criteria for cystic fibrosis. It's called the sweat test. Have you ever heard of it? That's what it is. I know. I know. Watch. I'm just telling you about it. They're real smart people who figured this stuff out. Right? Yeah. Come on, cut it out. Tell me uh, you got that. Other people trying to find a cure for it? Yes. And what it will ultimately be is it will be uh, 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 pilocarpine. Um, Pilocarpine is a drug that they give you to uh, when they do a dilated eye exam, <coughs> right? That's why they say you gotta have somebody to drive you home. And also, if you take the pilocarpine or atropine in your eyes, then it will cause your heart to race because you're blocking the parasympathetic, and then you get this. 
See how this all comes together? I thought it was the creature that... Huh? You said atropine? Yeah, atropine. I thought that was for secretion. No, uh, wh watch. When do you need saliva? When you're eating. When people got congestive heart failure, they produce more secretions. So they give them atropine because atropine blocks the parasympathetic nervous system so it dries up their saliva. The education continues. Yeah. I didn't give it to them. I let them just drown in their own spit. There you go. That'll learn you. When my mom was dying, right, uh, they had the morphine pump on her. So that we could give her morphine under the tongue. And my sister's like, well, you can only give it every four hours. I said, give it to her. I said, I'll give it to her. So I kept giving it to her. And you could see her, like her breathing slowed down. She started going to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Then her fingernails started turning blue and her hands started turning cold. Is the body's last attempt to try to maintain blood flow to the, you know, the brain and the vital organs. And then I could feel her pulse and her pulse was slowing down. So you can actually tell somebody's blood pressure based on their peripheral pulses. So if you can, if you can palpate a radial artery, you know that their systolic blood pressure is at least 90. Brachial artery, 70, right? Carotid artery, 50. And then you couldn't feel her, art, and I'm like, it's happening. And then um, we also get by to my mom, and it was really fun, there's seven of us. So I go, Ma, this is Tim. And I go, I love you. And she goes, I love you too. Then my sister Kathy was a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> she goes to my mom, Mom, this is Kathy, I love you. And my mom goes, I love all my children. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> oh, God. Can I tell you, God bless him. God bless him, right? I told my mom, she goes, um, when she was diabetic, right, I made her up this diet. It was a work of art. It was a work of love. It was beautiful how I put this thing together, right? And then my mom read it and looked at it. She goes, I got to eat like this the rest of my life? I go, yeah, mom, you're diabetic. She goes, uh, well, I really enjoy eating. <laughs> So I took it and I tore it up and I said, enjoy your life. Right? What are you going to do? I brought my grandpa with burgers and fries. Oh, hell yeah. Right? You're dying? Cut it out. Yeah. Right? What I'm going to do is if I know that I'm starting to go downhill, like mental, well, mentally I already have, but <laughs> like where I can't take care of myself, like I can't get to the bathroom and stuff, on a nice warm summer day, I'm going to run, I'm going to walk right in front of a truck. Right? <laughs> See that? Huh? Well, so what? I'll leave a note. I'll leave a note. <laughs> right? Or what would be better, a badass way to go out, is go on a helicopter ride and then jump out of the helicopter. Oh right? I, like, I don't want to go out like that. Didn't you say a guy tried to do that? Yeah, and he lived. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to make sure you go a little higher, dude. Because, <laughs> you know, it's not the fall that kills you. It's the Delta T. You know, the change in time from your falling to you stop. That's what kills you. The delta T. Delta's change. Forget it. Try to throw in a little physics. What do I get? Heartache. Okay, here we go. That's uh, cystic fibrosis, yes? Yes. Okay, here we go. I'm going to answer some questions. I'm just doing it. Oh, look at this. Eee. Would you want that? I always think of this as a mole, as a neve, as Aaron Neville. That's how you remember that. Right, he had that big mole on his face? <laughs> eh, okay, that helped you. <laughs> yeah, if that mole starts looking like Abraham Lincoln, you need to have that checked out. Okay, here we go. How many holes do you breathe out of? Two nostrils and a mouth, right? Okay, watch. There's negative pressure in that plural space. Okay. Say yes. yes. Okay, now watch. Try this. Try this at home. Try this with your kids. Put your fingers on your ribs and then take a big deep breath in. 
What happens to the distance between your ribs? They get bigger. Tell me you got that. So watch. This is what you'll see, especially if you work in an uh, emergency room, you will see uh, what are called sucking chest wounds. And just so you know, all chest wounds suck. <laughs> now, watch. And this is no joke. If you come upon somebody and they've been stabbed in the chest, that's a knife. <laughs> okay? If they got stabbed in the chest, when you cut bread, do you go like this? You know, I believe that. <laughs> right? The knife cuts both ways. So if the knife is in there, you don't want to be pulling it out because you don't know what you're about to cut. And they could be alive, and then you pull it out, and you sever an artery, and then they exsanguine it. Yeah, look that up. Right? They'll bleed to death. So what you do is you pack the knife, the stuff around the knife so air can't get in, and you get their fatty acid to the emergency room. Tell me you got that. Now, what happens if someone really doesn't like you, and they stab you and pull the knife out, and then do it again, and then pull the knife out, and then they run away? It, now you have four holes to breathe out of. You got me? So... Now you have that hole in your chest, and when you take a breath in, that hole will get bigger, and air will get sucked into the pleural cavity. But when you blow the breath out, the distance between the ribs decreases, so that hole blocks itself off. And with every breath you take, I'm watching you. <laughs> every breath that you take in, more air gets stuck in the pleural space, and it will begin to compress the lung. That's called a tension pneumothorax, and that's life-threatening. Because if it's not treated, what's in between the lungs? Please get this right. Good. You realize that was hard? <laughs> or someone with a very small pelvis and a big butt. <laughs> that's the top view. Just say no. Okay, so what can happen is that uh, lung will compress and then it will begin to compress the heart. And if you compress the heart, the heart cannot fill and you will die. The compression of the heart is called cardiac tamponade. And that can occur very, very quickly. So let me show you an x ray of dude with a tension pneumothorax. Now, watch. Here is his left lung. Here is his heart. Now the heart's supposed to be here. It's pushed all the way over here, and then this is what is left of his right lung. This is all air. And you can see a chest tube is in here, and he's hooked up to all these uh, EKG wires and stuff, and then he's also got a turd right here in his descending colon. That could be causing a problem for him too. <laughs> so what they do is initially like in the emergency room is they'll block up the hole and then they do what's called a um, a needle aspiration Num uh, where is it a needle decompression so watch you said needle a needle decompression so this is an actual needle decompression performed by a doctor in the Soviet Union so I will interpret for you Okay, Dr. Oldovtsin of Franisan, there, okay. So, watch. So this is the thoracic cavity. There goes the needle, right? It goes in between the ribs, and the needle has a one-way valve on it. So you pull the needle out, and then you're left with the plastic catheter. So the air is allowed to escape, but when he takes a breath in, the air won't re-enter through that hole because it's got a one-way valve. And slowly, that air uh, will be removed and the lung will reinflate. That's a needle decompression. And it's got a one-way valve on it. But ultimately, to make sure that that lung stays uh, reinflated, what they typically do is put a needle to, uh, or a, a chest tube in the person. 
So the chest tube goes in the pleural space, and that chest tube is to suction, and it will suck that air out. They don't have to worry about that needle, that plastic. No, no, no. That's why they took the needle out. So that plastic will give, and they can't completely reinflate the lung with the needle decompression just to make it so it's a little more comfortable for him to breathe. And then they'll stick the, the chest tube uh, to suction in there. Will so, they take that plastic piece out? Yeah. And then they'll, they'll have to cut and then stick the chest tube in, and then they apply the chest tube to like a vacuum to suck out the remaining air. And then they'll leave that in for a day or so, they'll do a chest x-ray to make sure that the lung is reinflated, and then they pull the chest tube back out. But uh, this is serious. I told you about the two guys that shot each other in the, I never told you that? Yeah, I did. Real quick. I worked at Parkland's ER, and they, I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 12-hour shifts, night. So it was the Knife and Gun Club, Friday and Saturday. So two guys came in, and they had shot each other. One got shot in the belly. One got shot in the chest. We were working on the guy that got shot in the chest, and they had what's called an eight-bed surgical pit, right? So we're working on this guy, and I am trying to get this chest tube in him. And the surgeon's cutting the other side of the chest trying to... Uh, in case his heart stopped, because I had to massage his heart. He goes, you ever massage somebody's heart? I go, yeah, every Tuesday I go to a club. <laughs> Anyways, as I'm, you cannot give the guy pain medicine or anything because you don't know the extent of his injuries. So I cut through the intercostal muscle, and I'm sticking the tube in. The guy is still conscious, so he is screaming. And as he's screaming, he's trying to sit up and reach for his boot. I'm like, what the, right? The other guy's over there. I don't know what's going on over there. And there was a big deputy. And he was like a classic southern deputy. Big gut, right? And he had this real thick southern draw. So anyways, I'm trying to keep this guy down, get the chest tube in it. In the meantime, he's bleeding all over the place. And then finally, he gets to his boot. And in his boot, he has a gun. So he pulls out the gun. He's trying to shoot the other guy in the other bed that he shot in the belly. This is a true story. Then the sheriff pulls out his gun and boom. And that you should hear how loud that was. And blew a hole in his chest and like blood goes spurtling. And I look at the deputy. I go, we were working on that guy. I'll never forget what he said. He posed a threat to you, sir. And then we lifted him up. He was dead, right? We lifted him up. He got shot in the chest. And the wound that was in the back was incredible. It was like his back was blown out. And I'm like, damn. That's a true story. And the guy that, the guy that got shot in the belly, um, he lived. But they must have not liked each other, man. <laughs> But I'm like, this is before, this is like 1987. They didn't have like metal detectors in there. So these guys were coming in. We used to get um, rough. Yeah, he was reaching for his There's a gun in my Because Ruby used to have the ice cream. How did I don't know. The paramedics had it grab his boot. Look, I don't know. All I know, it was in there and he pulled it out. It wasn't a big one. You know, like a little... He had big boots on. <laughs> you ever you ever been to Texas? You ever see those cowboy boots and the hats? And these guys weren't road scholars either. But yeah, I couldn't believe that. Blew him away. The sound of that shot in that ER was because it was a surgical pit. That's what they called the eight bed surgical. It was like a lower level of the ER, and that percussion of that sound. That was weird. We used to get robbed at gunpoint for the drugs. Right? They put, like, I've had a 44 or 45 pointed at my head. Give me all your drugs. I'm like, okay. Right. I said, here, no problem. Whatever you need, here you go. Right? But these nurses, damn. We used to have guys from the prison come in because it was a county hospital. 
they would be in a ball and chain. I thought that was fake. They had a ball and chain on, and they're sitting there with a ball and chain. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Then a pregnant lady comes in, and this nurse, she was like 55, the big hair, right? And she looks at that convict, get your ass up and let this pregnant woman sit down. And they're like, yes, ma'am. And he's like, pick up the ball. <laughs> it's it like, damn. They were tough. I'm, and they were good. God, they were good. Those surgeons in there, man, they were good. And those nurse, they were incredible. I'm like, I'm like, I don't belong here. I ain't that good. And they told me, and a lot of, you don't belong here. And I, I worked there two years, and then finally, after a year, they, I got a little respect. You know why? I was the only one who could start IVs on infants. I, it was a talent. So a baby would come in, the baby would be in bad shape, call Sorensen. So I would come running in there, and I could get it like in the foot, and it was like, I would just go right and boom. And they're like, how do you do it? I'm like, I don't know. I really didn't know, but I, ne I rarely, if ever, missed. Then you, you guys remember, uh, uh, he was a defensive back for the uh, Cowboys, Charlie Harris, number 41, by the way. He came in, he fell off of a ladder while he was cleaning leaves out of his gutter and dislocated his shoulder. And this is when I first started. So what you do is you start an IV, you give him Valium to relax him, then you lay him prone and you have him hold a pail of water and fill the pail up with water. And as the water weight increases, it'll snap the shoulder back into place. Yeah. So this guy has got garden hoses for veins. <laughs> so I go in and I miss the first time. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I missed. I'm sorry. He goes, ah, that's OK. So the second time I go in and I missed again. And he looks at me and he goes, get somebody who knows what they're doing. I go, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? So you can get the babies when I am? I don't know why. But those little babies, like, and women had no veins, I'm like, boom. But if they had hoses, I'm like, uh, where do you go? There's too much pressure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was weird. But, like, blood drawing, I don't miss. Hmm. Right? And here's why. Watch. When you put the needle underneath the skin, you have a vacuum. So once you get it underneath the skin, you push in the vacutainer, and then you slowly advance the needle. And once you see that flashback, you know you're in. That's how you do it. And they won't teach you that. Do you know why? Because they ain't cool like that. Tell me you got that. OK, here we go. Watch. Let me do this at least. All right, then you can ambulate. Guys. You need to watch those videos on the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Do you understand? I'm not even playing. What do you mean? <laughs> did you watch the oxyhemo? You did? Yeah. You're kidding me. Yeah. Well, here we go. The no. There's other ones I told you to watch. There's one on the pulmonary function you need to watch. Um, how and why we breathe, too. There's one there. You got me? All right. I explained to you partial pressure, yes? What's the partial pressure of oxygen that we breathe in the atmosphere? Bess, if you get this right, you can ambulate home. No. You've been tricked. <laughs> What's air made out of? You have, how many people had chemistry? Okay, watch. One atmosphere, the pressure of one atmosphere is 700 millimeters of mercury. Tell me you got that. What's air made out of? And a little bit of CO2, we won't even talk about it. Watch. Air is 79% nitrogen. 
Nitrogen is kind of like many of the students that are in my class. Nitrogen that you breathe in is the amount of nitrogen that you breathe out. It does not involve in any chemical reaction. So all nitrogen does is take up space. <laughs> Oxygen is 16%. You got me? Now, what is 79% of 760? Well, I'll tell you, it's 600. So the partial pressure of nitrogen, meaning the amount of pressure that nitrogen contributes to that 760 is 600 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, is therefore 160. And if you add up the partial pressure of nitrogen and the partial pressure of oxygen, you get 760 millimeters of mercury. So what is the PO2 of the air that we breathe in? 160. Can you breathe out all the air in your lungs? No, I established that. So watch. The PO2 of the residual volume in your lungs is about 40. That's the residual volume. So when you breathe in air that has a PO2 of 160 and it mixes with the air, the residual volume with the PO2 of 40, by the time that air gets down to the alveoli, it has a PO2 of 100. Why? Because the PO2 of the air that you're breathing in is mixing with the residual volume that has a relatively low PO2. Tell me you got that. So you're basically averaging those two, that the amount of air that you take in with a PO2 of 160, and you combine it with an air of, of the air in the lungs with a PO2 of 40. 40 plus 160 is 200, divided by two is 100. So that's why the PO2 of the alveoli is 100. That answers another question. Why is the PO2 of the atmosphere greater than the PO2 of the alveoli? Now, watch. If you could blow out all the air in your lungs, all of it, and then take a new breath in, what would be the PO2 of the alveoli? It would be 160 because you're completely blowing that air out and then bringing a completely new breath in with a PO2 of 160. But you can't blow all that air out. Say yes. All right. So watch. In the alveoli, what's the PO2 of the air? It's 100 millimeters of mercury. One of the ways that you can transport oxygen is dissolved in the plasma of the blood, right? And the amount of oxygen dissolved in the plasma of the blood is measured as a partial pressure, PO2. What's the PO2 of venous blood? And before you answer it, where do you want the oxygen to go? You want it to go from the alveoli into the plasma. So the PO2 of venous blood would have to be higher or lower than 100? Lower. And the PO2 of venous blood is 40. So oxygen will move by pressure from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillary until the PO2 of the alveoli and the PO2 of the pulmonary capillary are equal. Tell me you got that. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, gee whiz, Tim, why don't you average it like you did before, right? Why are these two PO2s equal? Well, the answer is, is that it would be that way if you never took another breath. But you are continually breathing in and out and replenishing that PO2 of 100. So that PO2 never changes, and it's going to move until these two are equal. Say yes. Where does all that blood now go? To what part of the heart? No, it already went to your right heart. Well, that was your other choice, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Where's the only place that nutrients and gases are exchanged in the systemic cap? I just told you. Okay, watch. What's the PO2 of arterial blood? Please get this right. 100. Where do you want the oxygen to go? Larissa? Brittany, I'll give you extra credit if you throw her under the bus. What's she looking at on her computer right now? Yeah, a document of some sort. <laughs> no, I don't. Where do you want the PO2 to go? The oxygen to go by pressure? No, it's in the blood. The only other pl right, the only other place on here is the cell. You want it to go in the cell and sit at the end of the electron transport chain, right? So does the pressure or the PO2 inside the cell have to be higher or lower than the PO2 of the arterial blood? Very good. And the PO2 is 40. So watch. Oxygen will move by pressure until the PO2 of the blood is equal to the PO2 inside the cell. And the PO2 of arterial blood was 100. That means venous blood has a PO2 of 40. Tell me you got that. What do you mean no? How many people? Oh, yes or no? No. What do you mean? Why? What do you mean other 20? Because you said that they all have to be equal. Yeah, I just didn't get that. From when you said that um, on the last slide, with the alveolar line, blood, you said it had to be 100. Yeah, 100 and 100. But when you go systemically, it's different. No, the, the PO2 systemically is 100. I put 100. Yeah, we'll go back. Go back. Okay. You see where it's 100 and it's around, right? Yeah. Okay. I got confused because I thought it would be 100 inside the cell, too. Why would it be 100 inside the cell? I don't know because I was thinking like this. You want oxygen. Where do you want it to go? You want it to go from the alveoli and get okay. dissolved in the plasma. Right. Then all that oxygen with a PO2 of 100 or all that blood with a PO2 of 100 is going to be going down to the cells. Okay. Where do you want that oxygen to go? Into the cell, right? So in order for the oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma to go from the blood into the cell, yeah. the cell has to have a lower PO2 than the blood. And the reason it has a lower PO2 than the blood is because the cell is using the oxygen. So it is like, think of a tire that you are removing the air from. It's deflating. So you are deflating the amount of oxygen in the cell because you're using that and converting it to water in the electron transport chain. Ain't that right? Say yes. And the oxygen will move until the pressure in the plasma and the pressure in the cell are equal. Now watch. What if this cell becomes more metabolically active? What will happen to the PO2 inside the cell? The cell's using that oxygen. So the PO2 will drop. I'm making this up. Let's say the PO2 drops to 30. Now the pressure difference is greater. So more oxygen will go into the cell by pressure. Tell me you got that. Now watch. And this is at rest. So forget the PO2 of 30. Watch. You're going to move that oxygen by pressure. And remember that the cell is continually using that oxygen. So it's going to continually maintain that PO2 of 40 because it's metabolically active. So it's going to drop until the venous blood has a PO2 of 40. Where do all the veins of the body dump their venous blood? My name is? Right side of the heart. The right side of the heart pumps that venous blood, and where does the gas exchange occur? Alveoli and the pulmonary capillary. What's the PO2 of venous blood? 40. What's the PO2 in the alveoli? 
100. So the oxygen will move by pressure until the PO2 of the plasma is 100. Then all that blood with a PO2 of 100 goes to the left side of the heart, down to the cell. Say yeah. So one of the ways that oxygen is transported in the blood is dissolved in the plasma of the blood, and it's measured as a PO2. Say yes. Okay, why is that important? Why is it, Jacqueline, why is it important? I'm waiting. You know what? I was going to give you this eraser, too. No, no way. I know, it really is. Yeah. You know how I could tell? Jacqueline was eyeballing this thing all night. <laughs> Watch. If you're working in an emergency room and somebody's bleeding their own blood, can you look at that blood and say, that's a negative all day? No. And if you give somebody the wrong blood type, you might as well kiss your nursing license goodbye. Mm -hmm. Right? Talk about it. Forget about it. They, it's over for you. Right? I think they shoot you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. And then that's they give you somebody else's blood type. Yeah, they give you somebody else's blood type and kill you. So it takes time to test somebody's blood to find out what type it is, mm -hmm. and then cross-match it. That takes time. It even takes time to get own negative blood from the blood bank. In the meantime, this person's dying. But you learned today at Gateway that what is plasma mostly? That's right, 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline. So what you do is you start big old IVs on them, you put pressure bags on it, and you pound that fluid into them to increase their blood volume and stop the bleeding. Then you put 100% oxygen on them and that ramps up the PO2 because you learned that one of the ways that oxygen is transported in the blood is dissolved in the plasma of the blood. And you can deliver enough oxygen dissolved in the plasma to sustain them until you can get the right blood type and start giving them the right blood type. Tell me you got that. That's why it's important to know that oxygen is transported in more than one way other than bound to a red blood cell. And that plasma is 0.9% sodium chloride. The education definitely continues. Say yes. All right? Watch. I'm going to do this and then you can ambulate. I'm telling you right now, you better look at that oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. That's right, Larissa. I'm staring you down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. Got off to a bad start today, me and you. Mm -hmm. Hope it don't continue. What are you, what are you, what are you drinking there? Water. <laughs> Can I tell you something real quick while I'm doing this? When I was in high school, not in high school, I was in college. We came home from college. It was a uh, summer break, right? So me and my buddy went to this bar. My, my older sister was there. So he says to me, hey, do you think your sister will go out with me? I go, well, I don't know. Go ask her, right? This woman is the meanest drunk ever. <laughs> I mean the meanest drunk ever. She's awful. So anyways, he takes her out, and then she's drinking. So what does she do? She gets nasty. So he goes, hey, Colleen, why don't you come back to my place? And she says, she looks at him, she goes, you ain't worth the corn in my shit. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I said, what did you do? And he goes, what could I do? I tucked my tail between my legs and I left. But I'm thinking to myself, that's an incredible insult. <laughs> I'm like, that's incredible. Yeah, if you want to use that. All right, that's free. <laughs> Tell me that's not a good one. <laughs> My family, I gotta tell you, man. Yeah. She is mean. 
I used to always, when she was younger, she'd always go out and get drunk, right? And I never drank when I was younger. And I would get so pissed off at her because she would come home and she would make a mess. Because she'd be drunk, you know, and like making some concoction of bullshit. And then just leaving a mess for my mom. And I would get up and I'm like, what are you doing? And she'd be like, so bad that before she would walk in the door I would hear her in the driveway fuck you Debbie <laughs> I swear to god I swear to god yep mm -hmm. no no this is my different sister this was a record she had two DUIs in less than a 24 hour period. She got pulled over for drunk driving, got thrown in the tank. Then my ma had to go get her out. She got out, she was upset she got a DUI, went and got drunk again, and got pulled over again. She don't drink no more. Can I tell you? I know. Uh, that woman was. To take care of my brother, right, and then to deal with my sisters. Oh, my mom looked at me, and this is a true story. Before she died, she looked at me. She goes, "You never gave me a gray hair." She never had to worry about you me. Never did. I never did. Wow. You're not gonna believe this. I was a model child. I'm not even kidding. I turned into a hell-raising adult, though. Especially when I started teaching at Gateway. <laughs> then when students. You know, they give me a hard time. <laughs> oh, it ends poorly. <laughs> what? I hate me too. Leave me alone. I'm doing this and then go home. Do we do anything tonight? Not yeah, really. But you said we're going to do this and then do the Yeah, now we're doing another thing. Yeah. So what? You got, I'm going, ah. You got three four questions. It's almost half the video. Wa watch. <laughs> what do you got to do? I'm going to do this, and then you're going. Watch. Now I forgot what I was going to do, and I'm all upset. <laughs> What's the best way to transport oxygen? Oh, yeah, we watch the videos. Look, what's this? Good. What's embedded in the heme portion of the hemoglobin? Good. What does oxygen bind to? Iron. And each... Iron can hold one oxygen molecule. And how many irons are in each hemoglobin? So how many oxygens can one hemoglobin molecule carry? And how many hemoglobin molecules are in each red blood cell? That's right. 250 million. Say yes. Now watch. The amount of oxygen bound to the iron on hemoglobin is measured as a saturation. You with me? Mm -hmm. And when the red blood cells go through the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries, when they come out the other end and go through the pulmonary veins and enter the left atrium, 96 to 98% of all the iron in all the hemoglobin has an oxygen bound to it. Say yes. Mm -hmm. So when they put the little clippy thing on your finger, what they're measuring is the amount of oxygen bound to the iron on hemoglobin. That's why it's measured in a percent saturation. That's why you read it like that. Tell me you got that. The best way to transport oxygen is bound to the iron on hemoglobin. Tell me you got that. All right, go. I don't care. You, watch. I'm gonna go over very quickly on Monday. Oh, wait, no, Wednesday? No, I'm going to go over very quickly the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. I'm going to go over that on Wednesday. Say yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I'll wait till the following Wednesday to go over. I need that multiple guess. How uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the blood. I went over oxygen just now, if you notice that. CO2 is a little more complicated. Guys? Everybody's got their time, yeah? It's next Monday, right?
Why did we do it next Monday? Why don't we do it? Oh, Wednesday is uh, trick or treat. How many people are actually going trick or treating? Not taking their kids, but actually going trick or treating. 